My name is Louise Goetcher. I'm one of the reporting radiographers here at Basel United and today we're going to be doing a talk on paediatric x-ray image interpretation. We will be covering the normal appearances of paediatric x-rays that you'll see coming in through the ED department. So we'll be looking at some normal anatomy, normal variants, the pitfalls that you'll come across when looking at paediatric films, normal paediatric fractures and also Salter-Harris fractures as well. As you can appreciate, paediatric skeletal anatomy varies massively from adults. Although all bo bones follow the same bony anatomical structure in that there is an epiphysis, physis, metaphysis, diaphysis and also apophysis that we see within children. Some of these terms can still relate to the adult skeleton as well. Um, Metaphysis can be used to describe just the end of the bone in an adult skeleton and the diaphysis as well, referring to the shaft. So as you can see here, the epiphysis is the little bony part at the very end of the bones. This contributes to longitudinal bone growth. The physis is a cartilaginous structure in between the epiphysis and the metaphysis, and this is where the bone is proliferating from. The metaphysis refers to the area of the bone that is immediately adjacent to the physis and the diaphysis is simply the shaft of the bone. There are different areas within the skeleton where you will see apophyses, whereas, as I've said, epiphyses contribute to the longitudinal bony growth. Apophyses are similar, it's just that they serve as tenderness or ligamentous attachments. You will see these at the fifth metatarsal base at the calcaneum and also the patella, although I hasten to add that list is not exhaustive. These are just examples of sites that you'll see apophyses. The fifth metatarsal apophysis is commonly mistaken for a fracture. Do remember that the apophysis here at the fifth metatarsal base is always positioned longitudinally, whereas a fracture will be transverse. This is an example of a norm, normal fifth metatarsal apophysis. And also, whilst we're here, normal calcaneal apophysis as well. There are numerous normal variants amongst the developing skeleton. Variations in the skeleton may also just happen on one side of that same person. They may not well be the other side as well, and they will massively vary from patient to patient, as well as age ranges. Common normal variants that you may come across are secondary ossification centers, multicentric ossification centers, or cleft epiphyses. But again, this list is not exhaustive. So have a look at this image just for the second. I have blotted out the epiphyseal sites. So just have a look, see, and try to remember where they ought to be. Although this seems like a silly thing to do, it is easy to forget or misplace in your brain where a normal ossification centre should be within the foot. And also the hand as well, I'm just to add, the hand ossification centres will mirror the foot. Some children will have extra ossification centres. These are commonly seen within the metacarpals or metatarsals and they're not to be confused with the fracture. So this is where the normal ossification centres are. They're the base of the first metatarsal and they are the distal aspects of the second, third, fourth and fifth metatarsals. And again, similarly, it's mirrored amongst the hand metacarpals as well. Here is an example of a child who has an additional secondary ossification centre. It is a normal variant, it is normal for them. They just have another ossification centre at the end of their first metatarsal. And it's just something to bear in mind. This isn't a fracture, this is normal development for them. And you can convince yourself as well that this isn't a fracture because the lines are smooth and well corticated. It simply doesn't look like a fracture but just be aware of these secondary ossification centres that can crop up. Another example of normal variant are multicentric ossification centres. Some 
um, some locations in the skeleton, these are more common. The elbow, for example, frequently demonstrates multicentric ossification centers. Here you can see an example of a multicentric trochlea where it looks very fragmented. Again, normal for the patient, but also an example of a multicentric lunate. This is rarer, and again, this list isn't exhaustive. It's just to be aware that these ossification centers within children don't all form the same. And like I said, if you x-ray the other side, it may well not be the same there as well on the same patient. Again, you can convince yourself that this isn't a fracture. These appearances are smooth. They are well corticated. They don't look like fractures in inverted commas. But again, just another little thing to add to your toolkit. These are normal var variants that we'll see within the paediatric skeleton. And another example of a normal variant that I'll show you is, is a cleft epiphysis. So here we can see a lucent line within that proximal phalanx epiphysis. These appearances are more concerning of a fracture, but please again bear in mind that this is an example of a normal variant. The, the line there, the lucent line, again, looks quite smooth. It looks like it fits together quite nicely. Again, an example of a normal variant, but as I've said, in these kind of cases, clinical correlation may well be necessary in that does it act actually really hurt that patient there if you're just not sure? Um, and again, similarly, x-ray the other side, it may not look the same. You'll see common pitfalls in the paediatric skeleton. Um, the appearances of an AP humeral head does commonly catch people out as it can be misinterpreted as a fracture. You can see that lucent line, that wiggly lucent line there, the uh, humeral metaphysis. And what you're looking at here is simply the epiphysis. Now, bear in mind that x-rays obviously work with superimposition and you have a ball-like structure that is placed on top of the diaphysis. And if you're not seeing that completely end on, which, which you're not, there is an element of rotation just by how the patient is positioned, you will see two sides of that same line. And that's what you're seeing here. This isn't a fracture. This is normal development of the um, humeral epiphysis and metaphysis. Again, you can convince yourself that this isn't a fracture, that it is lovely and smooth. Um, it's not jagged. And you'll start to appreciate these findings. You'll see this more and more amongst um, the developing ch children's shoulder as well. OK, so looking more at paediatric fractures now. Um, it's important to understand that the paediatric skeleton is far more elastic than the adult skeleton, and that will lead to the bones bending rather than breaking. Typical paediatric fractures that will demonstrate this kind of fracture pattern include a, a buckle or a torus fracture a green stick fracture or bowing fractures. You may have heard of a plastic deformity fracture as well. That's the same as a bowing fracture. Other paediatric fractures that you'll see are fractures that involve the growth plate. These are Salter Harris fractures. And amongst all of these other paediatric specific fractures as well, you'll also see normal fracture patterns that you are more accustomed to seeing within the adult skeleton as well. So transverse fractures, spiral fractures, or avulsion fractures, for example. So looking at buckle fractures, uh, buckle fractures where the bone bends, but the cortex doesn't break. Some buckle fractures will affect just one cortex, some will affect both, and they can be very, very subtle. So this um, lateral wrist here shows an example of a buckle fracture of the dorsal aspect of the distal radial metaphysis. Assess that vase shape of a long bone. Now, all long bones follow the same shape, that same pattern, regardless of whether it's a very large long bone, such as a femur, or a short long bone, such as a phalange of your finger. They, they undulate, they go out and then in and then out again, much like a vase does. Where you lose that nice, smooth, out, in, out contour, have a high suspicion of a very subtle buckle fracture. This is demonstrated here on the lateral projection where the dorsal uh, cortex of the radius just flares a little bit posteriorly. Another example here, 
So this case pronounced a, a demonstrates a pronounced buccal fracture of the distal radius. You can see an obvious defect within that dorsal cortex there on the lateral and also on the AP as well. You can see the undulations of the um, radial cortex, both medially and laterally, and also the lucent line within the middle of the diaphysis there as well. However, this case also demonstrates a very, very subtle distal ulnar fracture. So this is where it's important to assess that vase shape of the long bone. Here, if you look with an eye of faith, especially in the um, zoomed in images, you can just see very subtle undulations, these disruptions of the distal cortex here. And that potentially is all you may see. Um, they can be very, very subtle fractures, um, sometimes even more so than that. Other examples of other subtle buccal fractures are on these radiographs. So just have a moment, take a moment to have a look at these. Here are the subtle buccal fractures on these x-rays as well. The lateral finger, the DP hand and the oblique foot. These buccal fractures are all again just examples of where that cortex just flares outwards more than what you expect it to do, more than its neighbouring bones. These are examples of subtle buccal fractures. Green stick fractures. So a green stick fracture is an incomplete fracture that um, demonstrates a cortical break on one side and then bending of the cortex on the other side. It more typically occurs within the diaphysis of the radius nulna or tib fib and it needs a bit more force um, applied to create a green stick fracture rather than a uh, buccal fracture. So bowing fractures or plastic deformity fractures are where the bone bends as opposed to breaks. These are much more subtle and very easy to overlook because to all intents and purposes, the bone effectively looks normal. It doesn't look broken. The um, lateral forearm projection here on the left, now that is obviously the same image as what I've just showed you with the green stick fracture. However, now assess the ulna and you can see that the ulna is bending alongside that deformed radius. This is an example of a plastic plastic stress fracture where it's just bent bent with the force. Bear in mind that these fractures, these, these bowing plastic fractures can happen without um, an adjacent and associated uh, green stick fracture as well. The, the whole limb may just very, very subtly bend. Similarly, the image on the right, that lateral wrist, the distal aspect of the radius here has bowed backwards. Again, another very subtle example of a bowing fracture. So we're going to look now at uh, toddler fractures, obviously typically seen amongst the paediatric population. Um, usually a fracture of the tibia caused by a child falling, rotating as they do, especially when they start to walk. Bear in mind that these fractures may be radiographically occult in that that bone has broken, but you won't necessarily be able to appreciate it on X-ray immediately. Where this happens, that child may well be brought back to ED, may well represent a few days later, and then you'll start to see periosteal reaction um, in keeping with a healing occult um, toddler fracture. When a child presents to ED um, of this age, it is obviously very hard to assess them. They can't explicitly tell you where it hurts. They're going to be distressed and they're not going to let you touch them and assess them particularly well. Be mindful that it is wise to not request simply an ankle or a knee. If you have any suspicion of this area, a full tib fib radiograph is recommended. These fractures can sit very much in the middle of the diaphysis and if we x-ray either the ankle or the knee in solidarity, you won't necessarily be able to appreciate it. So 
when you have a child who um, has had an innocuous injury or perhaps an injury hasn't even been identified but they're not using their leg, do have a low threshold for uh, requesting a full tib fib view. Examples of non-paediatric specific fractures. These are the injuries that we see just amongst the adult population as well. And I just want to show you this just to be mindful. It's not all about the, the paediatric specific fractures within the paediatric population. We're not just looking at buckle fractures or green stick fractures. We have a whole host of injuries that we can see as well. Moving on now to Salter-Harris fractures. Um, Salt Harris fractures again are paediatric specific fractures and they will always involve the growth plate. There are five main types of Salt Harris fractures, although these have been further subcategorized. Um, furthermore, some um, of the, the Salt Harris fractures can't be appreciated on x ray. So, we're just going to talk about the five main Salt Harris fractures today, and these are the patients that you will see coming in through ED that you'll be able to appreciate the findings of. So, nice little diagram and a nice little way to remember it. So, we have the normal bone on the left, type 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5. S-A-L-T, Mr. E, R, Salter, corresponds quite nicely to type 1 through 5. So, S for a slipped epiphysis, type 1. A for a fracture that involves above the growth plate, above the epiphysis. Type 3, L, is a fracture that occurs below the growth plate involving the epiphysis. A type 4 fracture, we'll see the fracture extending all through the epiphysis, so from the epiphysis through the physis and into the metaphysis. And then type 5, a crush fracture where the epiphysis is effectively rammed together. This is quite a nice way of remembering um, the classification when you see a radiograph, you think, oh, which way is it? Just think Salter, and then you can work out whether it's one, two, three, four, or five. So, Salt Harris type one fracture, a slipped epiphysis. A nice example of a slipped epiphysis is Sufi. And although type one fractures can occur elsewhere, be mindful that if there is even a tiny, tiny fragment adjacent to that, which has um, arisen from the metaphysis, that then becomes a salt Harris II fracture. A, a true type one fracture is literally a slip of the epiphysis from the metaphysis with no other fracture of that metaphysis. Here is a quite an obvious example of a slipped upper femoral epiphysis on the left side. This is obviously quite grossly displaced. Now's the next chance just to talk about Sufi. Um, when assessing for a Sufi, for a slipped upper femoral epiphysis, you need to draw Klein's line, which is a line drawn from the proximal neck of the femur towards the femoral epiphysis. And this line should always intersect the femoral epiphysis, like so. So you can see here on the right side, Klein's line does indeed involve a small margin of the femoral epiphysis, and that is all it needs to involve. It's, it's not a massive amount, it just intersects it. But you can see on the left side, you draw that same line and Klein's line is now missing that upper femoral epiphysis. So what you're seeing here is a subtle and early stage slipped upper femoral epiphysis. Moving on to Salter Harris type two fractures. This is the most common Salter Harris fracture that you'll see um, involving approximately 75% of these physeal injuries. And as I've just mentioned, even if there's just a tiny fracture fragment that has arisen from the metaphysis, regardless of how displaced that epiphysis is, this is a type two fracture. So you can see here on this lateral finger, you could easily start to think that this would be a salt harris type 1 fracture but if you zoom in you can see these metaphyseal fragments here so this is a displaced salt harris 2 fracture salt harris type 3 the fracture is below the growth plate 
Here you can see on the third and fourth proximal phalangeal epiphyses, the fracture runs from that in the um, articular surface up to the physis and then along the physis, not involving the metaphysis at all. So these are Salter Harris type three fractures. Salter Harris type four, fracture extending all the way through from the uh, metaphysis through the physis involving the epiphysis and into obviously an articular surface. This is a scaphoid series and you can appreciate fractures on these images but if you look at it all together you realise that the fracture is seen within the uh, metaphysis, the distal radial metaphysis and if you look closely at the DP projection and also the DP oblique projection at the top right, you can see a subtle fracture line extending through that um, epiphysis and into the articular surface. So this is an example of a type four fracture. And as an aside, this patient also has a little avulsion fracture of the ulna styloid as well. Harris type 5 fractures are the rarest, their prognosis is the worst and unfortunately you, they're the hardest to spot, um, sometimes actually not really radiographically appreciable at all. Um, I don't have an example of a Salt Harris type 5 fracture in my case of x-rays I've accumulated. For example, this image here I had to take from Wikipedia. So these are crush fractures where that epiphysis has been rammed together onto the metaphysis. This is highly damaging for the physis. And not only this, um, because these, these um, appearances can be so hard to identify, or if not impossible to identify um, radiographically, it is obviously understandable how and why they get missed. These appearances are much more appreciable if the patient is in an MRI scanner, but of course we don't routine the MRI patients with an ED, of course we don't. So it's just something to bear in mind that unfortunately the, the, Im, the injury that has the worst prognosis is happily the rarest, but also the one that you're probably not going to be able to appreciate. So I'm going to have a look at some x-rays now. Fuchs at school, bony tender and swelling distal radius, swelling reduced power, query buckle fracture. So you should be able to appreciate that there are minimally displaced buckle fractures of both the distal radius and ulna. Pushed over at school, falling onto right shoulder, pain plus plus, and limited range of movement. Rule out fracture. So this is an example of a Salter Harris 1 fracture. There's no metaphyseal bony fragments associated with it, so this um, humeral head epiphysis has literally just been knocked off, it has slipped off of the adjacent metaphysis. So this is a double sword Harris one. Three legged race yesterday, fell and hyperextended fingers, swelling and bruising to dorsum of hands, tender and swollen ring and little fingers. Query fracture. So here there are buckle fractures of the middle ring and little finger. Now the middle finger is very, very subtle, but use your imaging tools when you're assessing these x-rays. Use your zoom, use your windowing, and I appreciate it's harder just by looking at this screen, but when you're actually looking at these x-rays, do use all of the IT equipment tools that you have available to you. If we zoom in on this lateral, you can appreciate that the third finger proximal phalanx dorsal metaphysis has flared outwards much more than what it ought to, much more compared to its adjacent 
index finger proximal phalanx. So this is an example of a further buccal fracture at this site as well. The ring finger and little finger are a little bit more easy to appreciate. There is um, kind of a sclerotic irregularity, a sclerotic linear irregularity, and also that easier to appreciate undulation of that um, proximal metaphysis there. But it's just to be aware, remember the satisfaction of search phenomenon. You've seen the, you've seen the fractures, they're the fractures that you're expecting to see with that clinical information, but carry on looking, what else is there? And in this case, there's another fracture of the middle finger as well. Fouche injury to right wrist playing rugby today. Query fracture. Okay, so there's a fracture of the distal radial metaphysis that extends into the physis. So this is in keeping with the Salter Harris II fracture. It's a nice example of where there is significant displacement of the epiphysis, but there's metaphyseal involvement. Um, you can see on the, especially the zoomed in lateral projection, that disruption of the distal radial dorsal metaphysis. And there's also tiny little fracture fragments adjacent to that metaphyseal surface. So this is a, Salter, a displaced Salter Harris II fracture. And again, additionally, a further fracture of the ulnar styloid. In a buggy this morning, tipped forward, unclear exact mechanism of injury, but refuses to use or allow touch to left forearm, query buckle fracture. This is an example of a green stick fracture of the distal third radial diaphysis and also a bowing deformity of the ulna. If you really follow that ulnar contour of the whole bone, especially on the HBL lateral, you'll see actually it does bend. It bends much more than what it should do. So another example of a subtle bowing deformity. Fall off scooter today, right ankle swelling and medium alveolus pain, crew fracture. So this is a undisplaced Salt Harris 4 fracture. You can't appreciate very much on the lateral projection. However, on the AP, we can see that oblique lucent line running sort of adjacent to the medial malleolus. That's going up and involving the physis, and then again, moving on forwards from the same, uh, in the same line, the same direction, is another oblique fracture line extending into the metaphysis. So this fracture has gone through the metaphysis, physis, and epiphysis. This is a Salter Harris ball fracture. It's gone through. Football collision, tender base, fifth meter, tarsal. So this x-ray is a little harder in that they have a base of fifth apophysis. This is a normal base of fifth apophysis and it's, it's a longitudinal line, that's fine. However, there is also that transverse line at the base of fifth metatarsal. So normal base of fifth apophysis, however, there is a transverse fracture that is extending through that base of fifth metatarsal as well. Jumped onto an embankment and dorsiflexed ankle, swollen, unable to weight bear, query fracture. Mm. 
So you can see a fracture that extends vertically from the tibial articular surface. That involves the physis, and then you can see this widening of that distal tibial um, physis adjacent to the syndesmosis joint there, adjacent to the um, distal fibula. So that fracture has run up from the articular surface involving the physis, and then transversely along the almost fused physis. This is in keeping with the Salter-Harris 3 type fracture. Tripped and hyperextended foot at nursery this morning, reluctant to wait there since. This is a really challenging x-ray. It's not where you would expect to see the injury, but there is an undisplaced oblique fracture of the distal tibial metaphysis that you can see just at the very periphery of the image. I appreciate that these um, images aren't displayed as nicely as what they would be if you were looking at this on a proper image interpretation monitor. You don't have your zoom tools or the window tools, but do remember to look at the whole x-ray. Uh, I know that seems like a very silly thing to say, but when I'm looking at x-rays, I actually start at the periphery of the image at the very, very edge. So I know that I've looked at all of it and I haven't missed anything. This is especially important within this age range. This, this is obviously a very young child. Um, they're not necessarily going to be able to tell you where it hurts or let you assess them properly. So really do give yourself the best chance of seeing any abnormality on that x-ray that there is to see. Really scrutinise every bone. You can just about see on the DP foot projection there that little loose line with the cortical interruption at the medial aspect of the distal tibia. And again, on the oblique, there's just an ever so subtle, slight suggestion of a lucent line there as well. And that's all you potentially will have to see, but it's important to be able to appreciate it where we can. So, paediatrics have um, obviously much more variable anatomy and fracture patterns compared to the adult population. And it's easy to feel intimidated when looking at these x-rays. However, if you use your basic toolkit of looking at x-rays, make sure that you look at every single bone um, and appreciate how those bones should look normally in inverted commas, then they become much easier to get your head around and appreciate what you're looking at. I always advocate if you're not sure, ask a colleague, ask a senior, ask one of the radiographers around an x-ray or if we're in the hot reporting office, then come around to us as well. Um, they are notoriously difficult. I'm not I'm not going to lie. They, they are hard to look at. They are hard to interpret, but they do follow a similar fracture pattern amongst themselves, amongst the paediatric population as well. Good resources that you can look at is Radiopedia. Um, Keats, their normal variant book, is marvellous. And also the Accident and Emergency Survival Guide um, is an excellent resource looking at not only paediatric fractures, but adults as well. And like I said, always feel free to ask us um, in radiology in the, in the hot reporting room. Um, we're always there to help you. I hope you've enjoyed this.